think that you're getting to the professional level and there will be the most professional and most advanced equipment. It goes back to the basics. It goes back to the fundamentals. We're doing RDLs most of the times. If throughout an 82 course season, you need to know how to properly maintain a body as well. Yep. So it's not always, it's just like being a professional athlete for us. It's not always the glam and the glitter that you might think about being a professional athlete or a professional strength coach. Think certain things that you have to do for each player. Hello, and welcome to the Physical Preparation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Robertson, and I'll be joining the line later today by Glenn Robinson III. Now, before we jump into this week's episode, I want to give you a little update that I think is pretty pretty important and pretty cool. Not sure if you know this or not, but this is actually our 300th episode of the Physical Preparation Podcast. And I have to preface that because way back in the day, like 08, 09, I think really before podcasting was a cool thing to do, I actually had another podcast called In the Trenches Fitness that ran probably about 40, 42 episodes. So about 2015, 2016 is when I started to get this, I don't know, this gut feeling that I needed to diversify my content a little bit more. I was writing a lot at the time, but realized, you know, I think I need to start bringing the podcast back. I think I need to start doing more video type work. And so 300 some episodes later, here we are. (laughs) I honestly thought at best it would go 100 episodes and I'd probably shut it down because I couldn't imagine recording more than 100 or finding more than 100 really engaging people to chat with and to learn from. But man, it's just kind of taken on a life of its own. And I think the feedback that I've gotten over the years the messages and the DMs and the emails that I've gotten from trainers, coaches, rehab professionals, young and old alike, about how much they enjoy the show, about how much they learn from it, about how it continues to impact them on a weekly basis is what has really kept me going. You know, there's a lot of times, like any big project or undertaking where, you know, there's times where you're just like, look, I'm done, I'm tired, this is hard. Scheduling people is hard. Coming up with questions for people is hard. You know, back when I was doing all the production and stuff myself, that was a pain. But again, you know, the people like you that listen, uh, that comment, that let me know that this is valuable and that is making you better at your craft and in your career is what keeps me going. So I just want to start the episode by giving you a sincere thank you. Now, you know, I had this grand plan for episode 300, I was going to do a big solo show and I was going to, you know, give you all kinds of knowledge bombs. And then, you know, I got a hard dose of reality over the last week, week and a half and nothing bad. Uh, but, you know, moving a gym turns out it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> it's a lot of work. So we had to move the gym. We had to not had to. We got to celebrate Kate's birthday. He was eight last weekend. So that was a huge deal. Kendall had her end of year soccer tournament. So I'm going to leave you hanging for another week before I talk about that. So needless to say, there's a lot going on. Plus, with Eric leaving, I'm working a lot of the night shifts, and Jesse hasn't gotten here quite yet. So needless to say, there's a ton going on. I'll give you the full update and full recap next week. And regardless, I want to get into this episode with Glenn. It seems like almost every day I talk to trainers and coaches who are frustrated. Maybe they're frustrated with the results they're getting. Maybe they're frustrated because they don't have trusted resources to learn from. And maybe they're frustrated because they simply don't have enough clients and wonder how long they'll be able to stay in this industry. So if this sounds anything like you, I've got something that I know will help. My Complete Coach Certification was created for trainers and coaches just like you, who are serious about the results they get and know that becoming a better coach can directly translate to a bigger bottom line. This certification takes the last 20 years of my life's work and puts it all into one massive course. In it, you're going to learn how to use the R7 system to create seamless, integrated, and efficient programs for clients and athletes of all shapes and sizes. One of the best pieces of feedback I've gotten about the Complete Coach Cert is that people that train gen pop people and people that train high-level athletes and everyone in between is taking something away from the course. You also learn how to create the culture, environment, and relationships with everyone you train so you can get the absolute best results. You're gonna learn the exact progressions, regressions, and coaching cues I use in the gym, from squatting and deadlifting, to pressing and pulling, and everything in between. 
And last but not least, I've got an entire section on my assessment process and how to use that to write programs faster and more effectively than ever before. Now, of course, there's a ton more that I cover, but that should give you a pretty good idea of what the certification is all about. Now, here's the thing. Spots for the certification only open twice per year for a limited time. If you're interested in learning more, my next certification will open soon. And if you join my free insiders list, you'll be able to save $200 when it opens. To get on that insiders list, just head over to completecoachcertification.com. Again, completecoachcertification.com, and then stay tuned for our launch emails very soon. Thank you so much for your support, and I hope you'll pick up a copy of the Complete Coach Cert when it launches. Not only is he just an amazing human being, but he's somebody I feel very privileged to call a friend. So if you don't know anything about Glenn Robinson III, he is the son of Glenn Robinson Jr. Many people in the basketball world know him as the big dog. He was the number one pick in the NBA draft. I remember watching him as a player growing up. Uh, I loved watching the Big Ten back at that point in time because Purdue, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio State, Michigan State, like they were just stacked. It was so competitive, and I remember watching the big dog go at it. And so when I got to work with his son many years later, that was a pretty big deal. So if you don't know anything about Glenn, he is a seven-year NBA vet, kind of bounced around a little bit. But, I mean, he played in Indiana, played in Detroit, played in Sacramento, obviously had some really good times in Golden State. Uh, Some of the best basketball I ever saw him play was in Golden State, and I felt like he was really heading, kind of getting into his own there. So you, you may or may not know the basketball side, but I think the side that's even more impressive about Glenn is the work he's done as the founder of the Ari Foundation. Ari stands for Angels Are Real Indeed. Uh, it's named after his daughter, Ari. And he's just doing some amazing work, helping empower fathers, helping families that don't have fathers that are in the mix. I mean, he's just doing amazing work through the charity, through the foundation. He does all these amazing events. And I think you're really going to enjoy our chat here today because we kind of run the gamut. We talk a little bit about basketball, how he got into that, why he enjoyed that. We talk about the foundation, why he's so enamored with that, why he started that. And we talk about his role as a father because, you know, beyond basketball and beyond the physical training side that that we shared together, there's this, this common bond of being a father and trying to do right by your children So I think you're really going to love this show. We kind of cover and touch all the bases. And man, I'm just such a huge fan of Glenn. So without any further ado, enough from me. Let's hear it from Glenn Robinson. Glenn, man, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Really excited to have you on. Maybe even more excited. People can't see it, but you're rocking that iFast shirt. Love that. But uh, could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, I appreciate it. You know, you not you might know me, but I don't know who else knows me too well. So my name is Glenn Robinson III, um, a seven-year NBA vet. I went to the University of Michigan. I uh, went to high school in Indiana here at uh, Lake Central High School up in Cherville, St. John, Indiana. Most people know it as the region. So the region, yeah, um, the region. You know, I was born in Gary, Indiana, and most of my family still lives there, if not Indianapolis now. So. Just an Indiana guy who was fortunate enough to play for the Pacers, fortunate enough to go to a a Big Ten school, University of Michigan. Um, I think something unique a lot of people don't know about me is uh, I was three pounds, four ounces. I was born premature three months early. So that's something. Yeah, that's (laughs) crazy. Now, (laughs) now, you know, being six, 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 seven, two, ten, two, fifteen, you know, see a guy like that that was three pounds, four ounces. It gives a lot of people hope um, yeah. in general, but especially like people that's 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 fighting with the premature. And I do a lot of work with the March of Dimes, and that's a foundation that I, I've always had interest in because you know so many people are just babies are born early, and you see these these babies like my dad said he has big hands, but my dad <laughs> said he can hold me in his in the palm of his hand. You know that's how small I was. So it just gives a lot of hope and a lot of faith. So that's something cool about me. A lot of people don't know. That's cool, man. I don't, I don't know. I, maybe I knew that, but it's been a minute since I heard that story. That's crazy. So, so give us some background, right? So, you know, obviously people know a little bit about maybe your dad, right? Uh, They watched him play basketball, but maybe they don't know about you. So you talk about, you know, 
growing up in the region, playing at Michigan. Like, walk us through kind of your career and some of your stops along the way. Yeah, I think that at a young age, my dad, and I think that this was very important for me to realize what I wanted to do in life. And my dad never forced me to play a sport just because that he played basketball. You know, he was just whatever that you love to do, you you love to do, and I'll, I'll help you through that. And I think that that was huge for me because I ended up falling in love with basketball for myself. And I was able to play and enjoy it outside as a kid. I was able to start my first YMCA league at five years old. So I was able to enjoy that love for the game for myself. And my dad, he would come to games and oftentimes he wouldn't even say anything, you know, or he wouldn't, he wouldn't be that guy that was up yelling and, you know, uh, going all crazy on the sidelines. You know, he was very quiet, very timid. Um, And he would give me pointers and give me tips and encourage me, but he never wanted to, to overwhelm me as a kid. And, you know, I understand being a number one pick, me being friends with Prince Jackson, now Michael Jackson's son, uh, I can only imagine being on a level like that, you know? So right. when your dad is a type of superstar, um, you know, I think that it's very important for the, the fathers to realize, like, we don't have to be like them. And if we choose to do that, great. So I think that growing up, that was huge for me to be able to enjoy the game for myself. Yep. Going to Lake Central High School, the next step for me was I used to shoot with two hands. And that's the <laughs> worst way to shoot the basketball. <laughs> As a kid, we just try to get the ball up there. So we're trying to throw it up there off the side of our, our bodies, uh, maybe granny style, maybe <laughs> it, however we can get it up there. And it yep. eventually affects our form of shooting. Uh, so now being a young man and going to high school, uh, I had a coach named Dave Malaznik, who was my high school basketball coach. And he came up to me as an eighth grader and I was getting ready to be a freshman. He said, Glenn, we, I see all the potential in the world. You're going to be a great player but you have to change your shot. Mm -hmm. And he still tells me to this day, I don't remember, but he tells me to this day, I rolled my eyes at him when he said that. (laughs) 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 And he says, I gave him this crazy look. So (laughs) that that, that part, I do believe. (laughs) So um, I ended up changing my shot by waking up 5.30 every single morning from my freshman year of high school until my sophomore year of high school. And that's when I started seeing my first offers and every single day, my, my high school coach, before I got my license, would be outside at like 5, 5.15 so that we could be at the gym by 5.30 honking his horn. And the more he would wait, my mom would just get pissed. And my, <laughs> mom, my mom is getting mad for me to wait. I got to wake up. Right. So right. it was just better for me. The earlier I woke up, um, the better everything was for everybody. <laughs> so um, I, I just learned at a young age to kind of establish everything at, a, at an early time to wake up, to be present. Uh, to get my work done. And that just really stuck with me uh, throughout my career. And like I said, that ended up getting me a scholarship, a bunch of offers. Um, my first offer was from Valparaiso University here in Indiana. Yeah. Uh, and I'll never forget that Bryce Drew offering me. And then I had Indiana State, some smaller schools, but Purdue and IU, they didn't offer me. And a lot of people don't know that. They yeah. never offered me. Uh, so I took the Michigan offer. I ran with it. And I wasn't really thinking NBA. My mom was was on me a lot about school, about grades. Uh, so I had to really uh, make a decision of getting my college degree. And I knew Michigan was a great school. I went to, to take a trip and go on a visit, an unofficial visit. Tim Hardaway and Trey Burke were, was my host, uh, my official. Yeah. And, and I fell in love with the school. And I was like, man, I got to go here, University <laughs> of Michigan, a football game. It was 120,000 fans, yep. uh, the basketball game, they were going crazy, you know, and I was like, this is just the perfect environment to play basketball at. Yep. I fell in love with the school at that, at that moment. Love it, man. Obviously, you know, your dad, pretty good basketball player growing up. So I would love to hear a little bit about walking in his footsteps, right? Like you get the offer to Michigan, you obviously played well enough there to get drafted. Like talk to me about coming into the league and what that was like? Was there always this expectation of you to be your dad or at a certain level or like, how did that play out for you? Yeah, I think that I eliminated a lot of uh, that with choosing to go to Michigan. Yeah, Um, And it really was all off of my back when they didn't offer me. So I didn't have really choice, you know, and there's an old story that goes back that says uh, Gene Cady wanted to give, 
my dad's firstborn son a scholarship to Michigan. <laughs> um, and he had it to, to, I mean, no, to Purdue rather. Yeah. And he had a choice to go to Purdue. Um, but I would never take something like that. You know, being a man, we always want to do something for ourselves. And I right. think that it started with that decision. But also going back to the beginning when I was young, he didn't force, my dad didn't force me to play basketball. Yeah. So I never felt like, uh, even though I knew who he was, I never felt like I was in his shadow or I never felt like he was overpowering me. The only, the only thing was growing up being on a young team in Gary, Indiana, and you got these young kids who know who my dad is from being from Gary, Indiana. Nobody in Gary really got anything. This is the hood we playing, you know, for pride and spirit and everything. Right. So every single time I would play, they were coming at me, yes. you know, so I did, I was not the best. I was probably the worst one out of court. And I used to cry at practice. <laughs> I, I, if you miss a layup, if you travel, you would have to do push-ups. Um, and I would cry because I couldn't do the push-ups. I would get in trouble. You know, I get home, my mom, she was embarrassed because I'm up there crying and everything. So, you know, it's, it's really a story about dedication and hard work in terms of how I gained success. But to answer your question is I never really felt like my, I was following in my dad's footsteps. I always yeah. felt like I was for me, uh, which is important. I try to tell everybody to find your purpose, you know, and when that love kind of tends to go away from uh, whatever that might be, it's time to move on to the to the next thing. Yes, I love that, man. Okay, so obviously this show is geared towards trainers, coaches, people that are kind of in my space. And one thing I'm always interested in is the role that plays in an athlete's development, right? And what you've done over the years. So really two-part question here. Number one, when did you get introduced to like strength and conditioning? And then number two, how did that evolve over the years? So like when you started to like when you're in the league, how did that evolve or change? Yeah, I think that there's a couple of factors, but I think I, re I remember starting to lift weights around my freshman year of high school. Yep. Eighth grade, we knew going into high school, we were going to have to get a little bigger. We knew the high school kids took protein. Um, you know, it might not have been the best protein. <laughs> right. it, it was absolutely not the best yeah. protein. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't the best protein, um, but that's what the kids did. You know, um, then you've seen seniors in football, they would start to take uh, creatine. There's some other muscle enhancers that they would try to take to be on a football team. And I would always look at some of those guys like, you know, why would you, why would you just do that just to be on, on a football team? You know, right. and it's not like um, most of you guys are going to go to the NFL, you know, and these are lifetime effects on your body. So it was important for me to start learning the proper techniques yeah. uh, early at a young age. And my dad, he also was huge uh, into lifting throughout his career. If he doesn't do anything else, even now being retired, once a day he gets a lift in. Yep. And he remembers every single workout that he's done with trainers and um, he writes down his programs and I'll give him a call and he's giving me an hour and 30 minute talk about uh, his <laughs> chest and buys that he did today. Just two <laughs> subjects, you know? Right. <laughs> so it's, it's definitely been in my life for a while in terms of, um, lifting and proper lifting. But it was important also because at Lake Central High School, we had a strength and conditioning coach when I started who was huge on Olympic style lifting. So we were doing a lot of snatches, cleans, jerks. So starting out, it was extremely important that I knew how to, to do my techniques and, and a proper way of lifting without injuring myself, especially as a basketball player. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing that, that always stood out to me when we worked together. And I know I've mentioned this to you numerous times is like, your technique was so dialed in and obviously you took a lot of time and effort to dial that in. But man, it's like, I never really worried about you getting crazy or getting into bad positions because you had trained your technique for so long. Yeah. And there's been times where my body uh, has felt off. We went to the bubble. I had a hip injury. This is known. I had a hip injury in the bubble, you know, and I gave you a call and I said, yeah. Hey, a lift that I might've uh, done it didn't feel right at the time, you know, with the injury that I had yep. and how can I correct some of these things? So we've had discussions and I think that it's so important at a young age that you become aware of your body, you become aware of proper techniques because you don't have someone like I, I had you to give you a call and understand you want to have some knowledge of how to correct things for one and why it's a, a issue to begin with, you know, yeah. and I think that that's, that's so important. Yeah. So you had that great foundation starting at Lake Central. Obviously, you continue to develop. What changed 
if anything, when you got to the NBA? Did you feel like you needed to shift or evolve your programming or what happened there? Yeah, I think to kind of go back uh, in college at Michigan, we are my strength coach. My next strength coach was he was Sanderson and he's known he's written a book and a great strength coach at the University of Michigan for years. Uh, but we did a lot of bulking up with him, or at least I thought uh, my body, it, it really gains weight easily or it, it, it you always say it, but it, it responds well to yes uh, training yeah um, I think that it's important that you know your players that you know your guys because most of us were on the same program and that's how most colleges are you tend to be on the same program at least like the guards the centers you know the big man from the guards but I, I seen my explosiveness it went up uh, crazy I was always athletic I was super explosive but I had this huge like mass on, me, you know, and yeah. I, at times I felt like transferring to the next level. I might have had to lose some of that yep. um, just because the game is a lot more athletic. I would say it's a lot more agile and, and you can't be out there like a football player. LeBron might be, <laughs> <one> <laughs> only one. you know, we talk about this as well as there's a certain percent of mass that you might want to put onto your body being a basketball player. So to answer your question, getting to the NBA, that's where you see strength coaches. And it actually surprises me because no knock on the NBA, but you think that you're getting to the professional level and there will be the most professional and most advanced equipment, the most, it goes back to the basics. It goes back to the fundamentals. We're doing RDLs most of the times throughout an 82 course season you need to know how to properly maintain a body as well. Yep. So it's not always, it's just like being a professional athlete for us. It's not always the glam and the glitter that you might think about being a professional athlete or a professional strength coach. Think certain things that you have to do for each player. Yeah, I love that. And I think that's one thing that a lot of young coaches need to hear and understand. They might think, oh man, Glenn Robinson, like this guy's touching 12 foot. We're going to be doing all this crazy stuff and like super advanced plyometrics. And it's like, all right, man, you played 30 minutes last night. Let's uh, goblet squat, push up to down dog. Make sure you're yeah. you're feeling right because we go out again tomorrow and we got to do it again. And most exactly. people don't think of it like that. You know, they just see like whatever. They think it's all Instagram highlight reels like 24 seven. Right. And not only that, you probably have to catch a plane. Uh, yeah. You have to sit on playing uh, before the next game, yeah. you know, so I think about their body as well. They might have sprained their ankle. So how are you, you know, adjusting to that? Right. Uh, we, we also, we, we do some, some water training, which I do enjoy on, on some of the days off. You yes. get in and do water training, I think is important. I think that there's two instances playing with the Pacers that I've seen professionals be just on two tiers of, and this is a, being in the mind of a strength coach, how would you handle this? So I'll ask you the question is, okay. you have a guy, Victor Oladipo never wanted to take a day off because that's just who he is. Yep. So you have to adjust your schedule um, in terms of how you, your program for him to a guy that's going to come in every day. Yep. So you're not going to lift crazy every day. You know, right. you're going to program a tender to what you think, the game schedule, his sleep schedule, you know, like yep. what time you guys get in, the flights. Then let's take it to the different end of the, the perspective where I'm a 22 year old and I see Monte Ellis, you know, he's 30 something. And he's like, I'm not lifting weights. I never lift weights. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not like, I'm not coming in here, you know, right. I'll come in here and I'll do some reasonable stuff. But then you, you have a guy, a grown man who is not going to do this because <laughs> he, he has made millions of dollars, right. Not doing this. Right. Um, but he, he's interested in stretching. He's interested in the modes. He's interested in other things, you know? Yeah. So how do you tender his program to fit the best for Monte? That's being in a life of, I think a professional weight room strength coach, because that's what I've, I've seen throughout my seven years that you have all, all type of guys. And it's yeah. like, you need to learn how the, the proper techniques to everything because you need to learn how to adjust each player. Dude, that's such a great answer and such a great, like, practical, real world example. Because every guy's different, right? Like, one to 15, everybody's different. Their background, their experience, we call it like chronological age. Are they 19? Are they 35? Their training age. I mean, you got guys that have never trained, like you said, in their life and they don't believe in it. And so they're not going to do that. So I think. Mm -hmm. You know, just to kind of fill in this little gap here, like one of the things that I've always tried to do 
whether it was in the soccer space or in the basketball space is you kind of got to figure out where can I fit into this guy's like philosophical overview of training and help him in the best way that I can. Right. So Vic Oladipo, Hey man, you want to go every day? We can do something every day, but I'm going to modulate it. Like you said, right. And we're not going hard every day. And I've had those guys that are like, I don't believe in lifting. I'm never going to lift, you know, like some of these soccer guys, dude was 35. He'd won a world cup. He played for Manchester United. He's like, I've never lifted in my life. I'm like, yeah. all right, Cleb. Well, we're going to figure out some stuff that we can do that makes you feel good and hopefully keeps you on the pitch another year or two. You yeah. know, so and, that's and fun. That's, and, that, and that's no disrespect to anyone's certification, qualification, no. anything in the strength coach world. It's just the proper knowledge and a proper fact of what can you honestly say to someone like that yeah. who has won a ring or has gotten to a certain level with what they feel comfortable doing. Now yeah. you have to just adjust to that schedule so you can make them to, to be the best versions of them. You know, yes. I think that I see that a lot with with fathers starting out young with kids. And then you get to, to coaches, to strength coaches in high school or coaches that's training um, maybe shooting techniques or different techniques and, and, and things, you you sometimes can't force things. You have yes. to adjust what someone is able to do. Yep. You know, when I first came to you, I couldn't do the ab wheel all <laughs> the way straight out. You know, right. so you told you know you, we have to adjust. Try pushing your hips down more. Try to roll out as far as you can to where it doesn't feel awkward and come back. Yep. And what and now I can do it all the way all the way through, yeah. you know, so yeah. um, you have to adjust and sometimes you have to give things time. You know, what's that saying that, you know, the, the, the teacher appear when a student is ready? You know, yeah. I believe that to be true in the coaching field in general. Yeah, I love that, man. Great stuff. OK, so I want to circle back because whether people know it or not, I want to remind them that you actually won the 2017 NBA dunk contest. Kind of a big deal. So I got two questions here. Again, I'm really messing you up with these two parters, but number one, obviously you got good genes, right? And that yeah. helps. But what do you feel like training wise helped improve your vertical? And then number two, about the actual contest, like I'm sure people want to know, like how much time and effort go into training that? Do you are you out there for like four months prior to yeah. working on this stuff? Like how does that how does that look? Let's talk about the training first. As a kid, I had this dream of winning a dunk contest. Like, I don't know, for whatever reason, it wasn't always about winning a ring. It was about winning a dunk contest. And I just had this vision. I would I would read this book called The Salt in My Shoes. It's a Michael Jordan book. He's a kid. His mom puts salt in his shoes when he goes to sleep and he's able to dunk uh, when he wakes up. That was like the story. Like that was the book of my life. So I remember being in high school, I ordered jump sole shoes, they didn't have the toes on them. It only had the heel or yeah. something like that. Like it had weighted heel on it. Yep. So they were to choose to improve your vertical. It came with a DVD um, <laughs> and like these other instructions. And I would just watch that and watch Duncan clips all day. <laughs> and I would do workouts. I would do calf raises about three times a day on, on my mom's stairs in high school. And I could not dunk throughout my freshman year. And I finally get to my sophomore year. I go up baseline. And I dunked and I was just, I was the happiest kid in the world. <laughs> and I just couldn't stop dunking from that moment, even though they were barely just grazing a rim. Yep. And my grandma at the time, she would always tell me, stop trying to dunk, practice your proper technique, pra- practice your uh, form, practice your shooting, practice something else. And it's sure enough, as soon as I was practicing that, then that's when dunking came. Yeah. So that's when I dunked my sophomore year. So that's kind of my training tip. But I feel like, I put in the work myself, but I also got my first trainer in fr- my freshman year named Andrew Wallen in Valparaiso, yeah. Indiana. Uh, he works at a place called Integrated Movement. Uh, I've been working there for a year, so shout out to them. But he really got my body and got me, uh, I think I was probably like one, 175, 170 when I got to him. And we would do vertical training uh, where you, t- where you t- actually touch the the vertex. Yeah, yeah, we would do the vertex, um, and we would practice that. So I remember him taking my vertical when I first came there, and then taking it when I got ready to leave for Michigan. It was it was out the roof, and at Michigan, I still have I believe the highest 
touch at like 12 2 or 12 4 or something yeah you you um, told me 12 4 because you said they had four. to they, they had to take the vertex if you don't know about a vertex it goes up to 12 feet and so you told me they actually had to put the vertex up on a box to get to <laughs> yep. where you needed yep we, they put the vertex up on a box to get up there to 12 4 um and i touched that i actually still have the video on my phone so i have to send it to you <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've never seen that i've got the one i've got the one from the trenches and you legit had 12 one in you that day because you cleared the whole thing and we didn't have a box that day but like you cleared the whole thing and you still had like half your finger above so yeah, yeah. that's crazy dude yeah you know and they say you jump at the highest peak and i'll ask you this question to see if it's true or not we can do some more research but they say you jump at the highest peak around the high school to going to college phase. So I would say like the senior year of high school, yeah. freshman year of college age. Yeah, I, th you I think it depends, right? Like the, the fact that you had like the force training and you did all the strength stuff and the Olympic stuff, that may be true. Like your freshman, sophomore year, it kind of like comes together. But it's so individual, right? Because I've seen kids that are like crazy bouncy and athletic. And then they do just a little bit of strength training in college and then their vert goes up, you know, or I see the opposite, right? The guys that train like power lifters forever and then they start doing plyos and then it's like, oh, well, I never touched this before. So now my vert's going up. But I would assume, dude, 12-4, like this, we used to always joke around. It's like, bro, I don't know if I can, maybe I can get you an extra half inch, but like how much <laughs> work is it going to take to get that? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, those days at Michigan, uh, I was kissing the rim. I was, it felt like every alley-oop that with Trey Burke was throwing me, my eyes were at the rim, if not above. So That's it's, crazy. it's definitely an age thing. I mean, being 19, 20, and like, I, I felt like I was floating. But to answer your second part of the question, what, what was it again? Yeah, well, how much work goes in to prepping for this contest, right? Like, are you out there for three months before, like three days out, you're like, oh, I better work on some stuff. Yeah, so I had got the call. Um, the dunk contest is January or February for the break. I had got the call probably about three months before um, and asked if I would do it. And I said, yeah, I would enter my name. My, all the teammates were like, man, you better do it because you get, I think you get like 20 grand if you just if you just enter your name. And then my teammate at the time or the teammate I had as my rookie year was Chase Buttinger. He had. Oh, yeah. Him. And he was like. He had some bounce. Out. He had some balance. Yeah. It's like you get about five or 10 grand uh, just to put the sticky stuff on the bottom of your shoes. So you better go out there and do it. <laughs> I was getting all kind of shit from my teammates. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I remember entering my name and everybody was excited for me, but they're like, you better represent for the patients, you better represent. <laughs> so we ended up getting a dunk coach named Chuck Milan. Chuck, from, he's from Team Flight Brothers. Um, so okay. they do all of these crazy dunks and they have professional dunkers. I had only jumped over Spike Albrecht at Mich at the University of Michigan, Karis LeVert. You know, we would mess around in warmups and I would jump over them. I had never actually jumped over someone other than just messing around with my friends. So I hired the dunk coach. We trained for about, he flew out, we trained for one weekend. And I will say I practiced about 60 dunks. He has a video of me. I fell. I messed <laughs> up. We were trying to stack people and put them on each, uh, each other's shoulders. Yeah. I messed up power. I was just, I was terrible. So we just <laughs> practiced and practiced. And a lot of people don't know this is in the middle of the season as well, yeah. getting ready to go to break. So it, I would just take time after practice or at night, I would go back to the gym after games or after practices and practice my dunks because I really wanted to win this, but right. I wasn't that good yet. So he came for a weekend, about 40 to 60 attempts, and I felt comfortable that I had three to four dunks that I knew that were 50s that I could just do for sure. Then I had two or three that I, were, I was just going to pull out, pull a, a rabbit out of a hat if I needed to use it. In, right. In a, in a, so I also had a strategy. I'm going to use my best dunk first to intimidate everybody else okay. because the odds in Vegas, I forget the exact odds, but they were all against me. Mm. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing all, all of that. I'm seeing ESPN. Like no one's expecting me to win. 
So I'm, like, I'm going to do my best on first because I know they're going to have me go first because they don't think I'm going to win. Right. I'm going to be the fourth one to, to win. So I'm <laughs> going to go first. So I'm like, perfect. I'll do my, my best one. And I surprised everybody with stacking my cousin on another person's shoulder, <laughs> um, jumped over him and windmilled. And Aaron Gordon missed his next dunk attempt. DeAndre Jordan didn't do a good dunk. And Derek Jones Jr., he also missed his next dunk attempt. And I think that it was just a mind and a mental thing. And from that yeah. point on, I knew that I was going to win. Bro, that is crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> I, I don't think you've ever told me that story. I mean, obviously, I knew that you won, but I didn't know, like, you had, like, a dunk coach and all that. And Joey said those team flight bros are crazy, too. He said they'll just yeah. be, like, laying on, like, the bench, and it'll be like, all right, time to go dunk. And they'll go up and just, like, pound it. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that there is a proper technique to dunking, especially contest dunking, just like shooting, just like anything else. And I, I learned small tricks. I learned uh, little things that helped me improve my skill of jumping and my knowledge of, okay, how to influence a crowd as well as kind of a, illusion of things. Like I did a dab while doing a dunk at the time doing a dab was yeah. cool. Yeah. So I did that while doing a dunk to make things look a little bit more difficult. I stacked my cousin. I'm not trying to give out all my secrets, but <laughs> I, stacked, I stacked my cousin on top of someone else's shoulders so that the, the person would, it would look like two people because it was, but they were really like seven, two, seven, three right. in practice. I had cleared seven, six, seven, four easily. So I knew that I was going to be able to do that right. dunk, you know? So they helped teach me small things leading up to the dunk contest. Dude, that's awesome, man. All <laughs> right. So kind of shifting gears here. One thing that we obviously share in common, we're both devoted fathers and we're both very passionate about raising our children the right way, taking great care of our children. So I would love to hear just more about your experience of becoming a father and what that's meant to you. Yeah, I think um, becoming a father has meant the world to me. I think that it's probably, it is the most inspirational thing. It's, it's one of the best things that you can do as a human being is to create another life, you know? So it's been really eye-opening for me to watch my daughter grow up. And she's only she's only three, about to be four, but it's been life-changing to, to experience that, you know? And I think that I encourage all fathers to continue to, to do the right things with their families and with their children because- it's nothing, it's nothing like it, you know, and it's yeah. nothing like uh, spending that quality time with your kids, you know. So since having my daughter, I've started a foundation called the Ari Foundation. Uh, Angels are real indeed, and we empower fathers and support fatherless families. So just trying to encourage people, encourage other fathers and empower them to continue to do the right thing. Yeah, no, that's awesome because... One of the things that I've always respected about you, number one, you've always been there for Ari. You've always tried to take amazing care of her. But then taking your platform and building this foundation is such a cool thing, right? Because like you said, you've got to follow that path of where your passion is. And obviously, this is something you're passionate about. So could you talk to to me and to the listeners a little bit about some of the events that you've done? I mean, you have amazing events. Like, and I know I'm biased because you're my guy, but like you've had some amazing events over the years. So talk to me just a little bit about some of the events and some of the things that you've done out in the world. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think that probably the most fun event that we've done and the most impactful event that we've done so far has been our father, our daddy, daughter dance. And also we recently did a how to change a tire event. We sponsored by Bell Tire. Um, and that was a fun event just because you get kids who, are so stuck in the modern day technology and on their phones and video yeah. games and everything. And it's like, what, what happens now that you're getting to an age where you want to get your license, you want to go, go out, you want to have fun. You might catch a, a flat tire. Yeah. And how do you change that? You know, how do you change the oil? We taught that. How do you change uh, windshield wiper fluid? You know, so simple things on a car that all of us are going to have to drive. Most of us are going to have to drive at some point. Uh, so those are the things that teaching other fathers, um, other kids in general, to do th things like that and how to events is so fun for us. We also have a pumpkin patch event coming up. It's called Pumpkins with Pops. Uh, we just encourage fathers to bring their families out and, and enjoy a day of fun. You get a free pumpkin, corn maze, haunted house, things of that nature. We do a turkey drive, a Christmas event. Uh, so we're all about just the community here in Indianapolis and Gary, Indiana, and giving back and trying to encourage fatherhood. I love it. And like I said, so much respect for the work that you're doing in the community. 
I mean, I know I'm around it, so I get to see it a lot, but just seeing the smiles on people's faces, building a community, right? Because you see some of the same people at the events, so you know they are enjoying it. They're enjoying that time with their family. So much respect, man. I love what you're doing. So, all right, man, big question time. And I ask everybody this. Uh If you could alter the space-time continuum and give young Glenn Robinson III one piece of advice, what would it be? I would say enjoy every moment, especially when I talk to the younger crowd. Enjoy high school. Enjoy playing for nothing, playing for fun. After high school, you get to college, you're playing for to get to the NBA. You're playing for, you know, maybe a another job or whatever that it is in any field after high school it just seems to the real life and real world hits and even once you get into college enjoy that enjoy being there you know yeah I look back I only spent two years of college but I wish that I would took more time to enjoy every single moment of those two years because I can't I can't go back I'm going to go back and finish school but I can't go back and be 21 20 19 you know um you know, 18, you know, whatever it is when you get to college. So I would definitely tell the young Glenn to enjoy every moment, even my biggest games in the NBA, guarding James Harden, shutting him down on Christmas. Enjoy that moment. Enjoy hitting a game winner with my father being president. Enjoy playing with Paul George, Blake Griffin. And I did enjoy that, but I wish that there was somehow we could go back (laughs) and every single big moment that we've had just relive that one more time you know what's even you know I think better about that is I would say the work that I'm doing now with my foundation and the work that I'm doing now to help others there's a lady who I helped in San Francisco while I was playing with the Warriors and she was sleeping on the floor her and her two kids they were sleeping on the ground my foundation I started it there with the help of Steph Curry and Draymond they inspired me to continue to to, to open up this foundation and really do it being fathers themselves they seen the great work that I was doing helped this lady get off the floor and gave them them beds furnished their whole apartments to be able to go back to a moment like that to see her face you know it's it's better than winning a dunk contest it's better than any of the other, other moments that I described you know to be yeah. able to act help someone with the gift that I was given. Yeah, I love it, man. One of the things that I always tell the young kids that I work with, right? Because you, Ed, Keelan, Dakota, you guys have been around for a while. You're a little bit more savvy. But, you know, these like high school and college age kids, when I interact with them, I always tell them wherever you're at now should be the best time of your life, right? Like, (laughs) Like when you're in high school, that should be the best time of your life. And then when you go to college, that should be the best time in your life. The people I worry about are when they get to our age, whether my age, your age, whatever, and they're still living in high school. You know what exactly. I mean? It's like, exactly. like, like you said, be in the moment, be where your, your, your feet are at, like right where you're at right now is where you're meant to be. And you're doing amazing work. And that's awesome, man. That's how it should be. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. Last but not least, we got our lightning round. Okay. I got five questions for you. All right. Number one, this one should, I don't know, maybe it'll be easy. Do you have a career highlight as an athlete? A career highlight? I would say the dunk contest, that's a little too cliche. I would say my buzzer beater in college at Purdue. I hit a buzzer beater at Purdue. My dad was also present to see that buzzer beater, to see that game winner. Um, So I would say that that's probably my next favorite moment. Okay. Man, you had some big shots, dude. You had that one. You had the one for the Pacers in the corner. You had yep. the one over uh, Clint Capella, the Rockets. Oh, that yeah. step back was nasty, dude. You covered some ground on that step back. Man. We were we were we were working on that all summer too because uh, you could probably explain it in better detail uh, to our fans out here. But there was a drill that we would work on all that summer because I was struggling with something in my knee. You know, mm-hmm. I was, it wasn't something in my knee, but I was struggling with the impact of yep. uh, going on to that knee sometimes. Yep. And we just kept working on that, working on it, working on it. And, t- and then it came just like natural instinct in the game against the Rockets on Christmas. And I hit a step back off of that right knee, you yep. know? So I think that it was just something of, to do with repetition of what we have been working on, not to, I mean, toot our own horn because we're yeah. on the on podcast, No, whatever. We killed it, bro. We, we killed it. <laughs> <laughs> but you did. I, I mean, I remember we were, we were on the court 
working on that step back, working on finding your heel, slowing that momentum down because you would get on your toes. Everything would kind of get pushed forward. And then, yeah, all that stress goes through your knee versus being able to distribute the force. So, yeah, yeah I yeah. clearly remember you know, that. And people, people don't know that we look at things like this because I also that summer or the summer previous um, when we would squat, there was sometimes that imbalance on one of my knees, the left knee or the right knee yeah. would tend to come in. So I, I always make sure that I ask questions like, OK, is this the proper way? You know, you would sometimes even hold my knees to make sure that yeah. they didn't go in while we were squatting to make sure that I was getting that proper technique. So yeah. these are things that we always would focus on and make sure that when it comes game time, you're able to do this at full speed without even thinking about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great stuff, man. Okay. Number two, out of the three spots we trained at, trenches, D1, and IFAST, which one was your favorite? I would say IFAST because we spent the most time there, That's you know, true. but it's nothing like the trenches. Nothing like the trenches. That was my first time meeting you. Yep. We had just our eval there, and then we we got to it. I'll never forget jumping on the, the ropes, the bands, you know, practicing fake dunks, you know, while you held yeah. me back. That was yeah. That was pretty cool, you know, and that was our first experience, I think, together, training together, first summer together. So Yeah, it was fun, man. We had a lot of dudes in that place. There yeah. was a lot of good work getting done. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Speaking of training, number three, I know you love getting Ari in the gym and getting after it as well. Why is that so important to you? I think because my father helped me out with that. My father instilled that to me and my brother when we were younger. He was big on you had to get 20 minutes of cardio a day. And you had to eat right at least once a day, you know, so he would okay. eat a lot of grilled chicken, vegetables, rice, something like that. Um, and my brother and I, when we would visit him, he would he would force us 20 minutes of cardio and eat something <laughs> good for lunch. You know, so it. that's what I want to kind of instill in Ari you know, with my daughter is to just make sure that she has just proper nutrition growing up. She understands how to be healthy. She understands uh, the proper way to work out and just take care of her body and her, her mental health. I love it, man. Okay, number four, give me your best story of G as a kid. And for those that don't know, G is, I always describe him as your little brother. But when yeah. I met G, he was like 6'3", like 298, defensive, yeah. <laughs> defensive end, defensive tackle. So give me your best G story. Oh, man, there's so many. Uh, but I would have to say <laughs> my brother, he wrestled. Uh, I remember him joining wrestling in the middle school. And we would go to his wrestling match and he weighed the heaviest, you know, so we would have to wait the whole hour and 30 minutes, the whole two hours, however long the, the wrestling meet was. My mom and I, our whole family, we would have to wait. And finally, G would come up at the end. And he'd just take this kid down in like two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> we were out of there. And we, and we were out of there. And we, everybody was like, we waited this whole time for that. You know, everybody was so happy that he yeah. won. But we were like, are you serious? You know, we just waited this whole time. <laughs> Uh, so that would probably, you know, be one of my favorite moments. But there's so many, you know, uh, having a brother, you know, my mom did such a great job. My mom and dad, our parents, grandma did such a great job of raising us Two professional athletes. You know, he's playing professional rugby now, had tryouts with the NFL, had a great career at Purdue playing football. You know, to be able to raise two kids like that, I mean, it, it says a lot about what they were doing. And I'm just very blessed to have a brother like that, you know, and we weren't always this close, you know, yeah. in high school, we used to drive separate cars to high school. <laughs> I didn't know we that. Had, we had different friends. Yeah. Me and G, we were on two ends of the spectrum. <laughs> That's so funny. I just remember you had a cookout. It was, I think the year we were in the trenches and you had a cookout and I'm like, damn, who is this yoked up <laughs> dude in the back? And you're like, oh, that's my little brother. I was like, man, this guy is huge. Like his forearms alone. <laughs> just he is a oh, huge yeah. human being oh yeah i think uh another funny story real quick i recently got a delorean and my brother i sent my brother to go to go buy it off of this guy my brother gets there he says that he picked it up and and the guy he forced the guy to give it to him he said the, the kids were crying and everything <laughs> <laughs> Just like took and snatched the DeLorean and drove on. I'm like, man, going with you, going with him somewhere is scary just because people look at him and think that he's automatically security. Right. Um, and he has played security for a couple of my friends before and a couple, you know, athletes and rappers and things. He's actually done security work before. You know, he's he's trained 
military combat. You know, he's trained in, in a lot of different things that people wouldn't know about. Yeah, that's crazy, man. <laughs> I mean, literally, he told me when he was at Purdue, he probably could have lettered in three sports between wrestling, football, and throwing. I mean, he was just a beast. So oh, yeah. he's yeah. a stud, man. He did. He did all three sports. I mean, and it's and now he just switched to rugby like it's nothing. So I he know. says it going back to football. So yeah, he's a boss, man. Number five, last but not least, looking in the future, what's next for Glenn Robinson the third, man? What are you excited about? What are you working on? Like anything. You know, in this field, since we're talking weight room, since we're talking strength and conditioning, I actually am on an advisory committee for a brand called Human Improvement, which is a new protein that's out. Um, we're huge on no blow. And I think that it's a no blow protein. You feel good afterwards. It's also a multivitamin, which I think that is, is good for me that I'm, I've been taking recently. I've been consulting with them. I think that that's going to be big for me as I remain in this kind of professional athlete space. Also with the foundation work that I'm doing, I'm looking forward to doing more things like this, more podcasts, more speaking engagements, um, just really dedicating my time to, to help people. I think uh, seven years spent professionally on and off the court, I've learned so much, whether that's financial help, whether that's uh, improving fathers' lives, or whether that's vertical training, helping young kids be able to reach their potential with sports. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what's next for me. But in those main three areas, I think that I'm going to have so much fun just helping other people. Yeah, I love it, dude. Well, Glenn, man, it's been awesome catching up with you today. Always great seeing your face. Where can my listeners find out more about you and all the great work you're doing? Um, right now, you can visit uh, myself, obviously, on Instagram. Uh, but arifoundation.org is, is big for us. Our website, um, my foundation, Angels Are Real Indeed. You can visit us there. We have a lot of things going on, a lot of resources, a lot of tools to help fathers. Um, but stay tuned to see what's next as far as I've talked to you, Mike, about this. But um, really helping people improve some vertical training. It's a lot of people, I get a lot of questions about winning a dunk contest and what did I do um, yeah. to really improve that that straight training part and just to get strong enough to be able to dunk. You know, there's a lot of people just want to be able to touch the rim, be able to dunk. Right. Um, and it's still popular to this day. So I'm going to be looking forward to getting some tools, some help for you, but I'm actually looking forward to doing an online class about that. So I'll be, I'll be uh, looking forward to getting some tips from you. That's awesome, man. Well, thanks again, buddy. It was great having you on. Thank you. Appreciate it, Mike. All right, my friend, that does it for this week's show with Glenn Robinson III. Really hope you enjoyed it. He is just a young man that I think the world of, amazing human being, doing so many great things in the world. And I think people like him really dispel the myth that pro athletes are divas or they're hard to work with or they're not great human beings. The guys that I've worked with over the years are amazing stand-up characters. They want to be great fathers, great husbands, great businessmen. And so I just want to continue to share that message. And I think Glenn is a great representative of that. So with this being episode 300, I got a small favor or two to ask for you. Number one, if you're not already subscribed to the show, take two seconds out of your day and do that now. We're not going anywhere. We're going to keep seeking out great professionals so that you can learn from them for free each and every week. So if you're not subscribed, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, Google Play, Amazon, wherever you consume podcasts, go and do that right now. Get signed up. If you are, I appreciate it. Go one step further. Go to iTunes. Give me a rating and a review. I want to keep promoting the show. I want to keep promoting the amazing people that take time out of their busy lives to come on here and you know just share with us their, their livelihoods and their experiences and the things that they're passionate about. So if you could give a rating and a review, continue to help me promote the show, I would appreciate it more than you know. So my friend, that does it for this week's episode. As always, love and appreciate you. So much support. Thank you. And we'll be back soon with our next episode. Take care. <laughs>